Amen. Won't you put your hands together and praise our awesome God? Amen. Won't you bow with me in a word of prayer? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We do desire that, more of you, more of you. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will speak now through me to these, your people, in a way that will be real, that will be relevant, uh, that will be helpful, that will uplift people, um, and that will glorify you. I pray, God, that you will use what I have to speak to these, your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you praise God for this band and for... um, Corey Barksdale, man. Hey, man, I don't know about y'all, but it's good to be here. It is uh, good to be able to gather together uh, and worship. Today is a very special day. We're celebrating 13 years uh, as the dopest church on the planet, City Point Community Church. And for some of you, I haven't seen you in a month. Some of you, I haven't seen you in a year. Um, but it's good to see you. My uncle and aunt are here, um, Pastor Dwayne Davis of the New Morning Star Baptist Church, uh, and my aunt, First Lady Vanessa Davis, are here uh, celebrating with us. And that's very special to me um, because um, they were also there the very first time that we had service, which was this Sunday, 13 years ago, in the Proviso West Auditorium, in the little theater where I used to go to detention. <laughs> <laughs> when, when there was overflow, like with, that was like the detention overflow where there was too many of us. Um, and here I was some years later preaching in that same space. Uh, and so grateful to God for this journey, for this time that we have been on together. Um, some of you have come on at different points of the journey, but all have been just important, just as important to us being where we are today. Uh, I look around and I see some faces that were also there on that first Sunday. Uh, I see Miss Jackie back there was there on that first, that very, very first Sunday. Uh, Vonda and Vina and, and Kayla and Paxton and, of course, Carla uh, was there on day one. And the Douglases were there on day one. And some people were there on day, day zero um, before we even got to day one. And uh, I remember the Douglases were coming over to the house and they were praying with us um, as we were, City Point was just an idea uh, at that point. And thanks be to God uh, that God honored, God honored our faithfulness, uh, God honored um, the work that we were doing. Tyrese was there too. Tyrese was there day one too. Um, where's Tony? Is Tony, did Tony make it? Uh, Tony was there day one. Um, God has been faithful. There's a lot of churches that have come and gone during this time, and God has been faithful. I was a 27-year-old, naive enough to follow God into this, and, uh, and here we are. And um, you may not know it, but people from all over the country reach out to us wanting to learn how we do what we do and um, wanting to uh, express how much of a breath of fresh air it is that they're can be a thing like this that exists within the body of Christ that is in many ways uniquely geared toward an emerging generation of people that love God but are looking for their unique ex- generational expression uh, of that love for God and service to God. And we have been an independent church uh, during these 13 years that has come with good and bad. The good is we do whatever we want to do. <laughs> There really is no accountability except I know if I go too far, Mama Douglas is going to call me. Uh, The step before that is Pastor Douglas calls me preemptively. And so those are the only guardrails that we've had, but they have been along for this journey. And their sentiment is like, if it's working for them young folks, if it's getting them young folks in here, they are for it. And so that has been just such a blessing. And I thank God for this work that we have been able to do and what we'll continue to do for years to come as long as God says so. Thank you to all of the volunteers. Thank you to all of the givers that have given over these years. There is no church with just energy, innovation, and, and idealism. You got to have some money to do this. Amen? You got to have some money to do this. And some of those names I called out, like y'all have been faithful 
givers along the way, those of you that have come along in year three, year four, year five, year 12, have been givers along the way, and that has made the world a difference. This ain't cheap, y'all. Let me say that again. This is not cheap. Um, and I'm, I'm going to get into the sermon in a minute. I just need to be pastoral for just a couple of minutes. Um, so a friend and I were talking not too long ago, and we were talking about how, like, just to do decent church, like, the expectations and the thresholds have changed so much um, that to do church, like, decently in today's time, it costs a half a million dollars a year. That's just, that's just what it is. The, the day of everybody doing, the, the day of the church consisting of, like, a pastor and a 70-year-old sec, well-meaning secretary as the, like, bulk of the church staff, like, that day is gone. That day is gone. It takes a lot of people um, working full-time to do this work every single day. At this point, we have a five-person full-time staff plus another five contractors, and I'm sure our staff would attest to it. They are overworked and overburdened with the work that they have to do in order to make City Point work. Um, and we pay them with real money, uh, <laughs> not, not prayer and prayer and fasting. We pay them with real money and try to give them a benefit stipend and try to be competitive because there's other things that talented people can do with their time, right? Um, and so it costs. It costs to do this. And the reason we've been able to do it is because of your generosity. So thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. During the pandemic, we were not face-to-face, -face, but you guys still gave, and that made a difference. It made a difference. So thank you. Uh, and to those of you that are skeptical, um, as you have heard me say on these videos week after week, I need y'all. Um, I can't fight with the devil and the banks at the same time. I'm just going to be honest. Um, the, this summer, like giving has taken a dip. Um, we haven't lost members, but members have been on vacation and living their best lives and all that stuff. Don't forget about this, because this is incredibly complex. Amen. This is incredibly complex, and it runs off of donations. And um, you try running your household when, like, May was this way, and then June, you had 20% less than what you had the month before. You try paying all your bills and not be worried at night. And so I want to be worried about your well-being. I want to be worried about the spiritual battles that you're fighting. I want to be worried about what is the Lord saying that I need to preach to these people. I want to be worried about pastoral care for you. I do not want to be worried about balance sheets and bank account balances and I worry about those things when it comes to me and Carla's entrepreneurial ventures but this ain't that this is our work that we're doing together that we're doing together um, and you all have expressed how much pride you have when you invite friends to hey check out this link my church is on because the video is dope and the, the quality is excellent that costs money and we are able to do it because of your giving. If that stops, if that reduces, it's going to be well-meaning person in the back <laughs> with a with a with an iPhone recording this thing. And that's that's just what it is. That's just what it is. And so again, thank you all and I I'm saying that very vulnerably. I need you all. Uh, last thing I'll say is I'm going on sabbatical for the month of August and I'm so excited to be doing that. Um, and I told our staff, just make sure that there is X amount of money left when I come back. That's, that's all I want. That's all I want. Just make sure I don't come back and there's nothing left to spend. Um, so I need y'all. I need that to not be a thing that I worry about uh, during this time. Amen? Amen? All right, all right. Let's jump into the Word of God. Uh, Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. We are uh, starting a new series entitled Sis. So for the last few years, I've been trying to do a series of preaching that have been focused on the brothers, series of preaching that have been focused on the sisters as well. Um, and so this month, for the rest of the month, there will be all sisters preaching. 
um, throughout this series. And so I'm really excited about that. We did it last year as well in August when I was on sabbatical. All women preached. They did a phenomenal job. So we're going to repeat that this year. I'm going to kick it off. I'll be the only male um, preaching for this series. But since it's anniversary, since we only gather once a month, thought that I should preach today. I want to jump into uh, Ruth chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 21. Um, It says, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me? And the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. For a few minutes, I want to kick off this series by talking about when sweet life turns bitter. When sweet life turns bitter. My favorite drink is the old fashioned. Anybody here ever had an old fashioned? That's my favorite drink, the old fashioned. Uh, to, To make the old fashioned, you need some good bourbon. You need simple sugar, or if you are uh, interested, you can take sugar cubes and a little dash of water and and muddle that sugar down, dissolve it uh, into the water. You also need a cherry, and you need an orange zest as garnish. There's also the big ice cube that you need to make a good old-fashioned. And one thing that you cannot forget that is crucial to the old-fashioned are the bitters. You got to put a couple of dashes of bitters in that old fashioned in order to make the drink according to the recipe. Now even though it only takes a couple of dashes of those bitters to go into that old fashioned, if you do not make it with those bitters, your old fashioned will not be right. Let me tell you, Bitters have their place in a good old fashioned, but nobody wants bitter in the midst of their life. But the reality is I have learned that sometimes life will indeed go from sweet to bitter. I do's turn into I don'ts. Life can go from sweet to bitter. I love you can turn into I don't love you anymore. Life can go from sweet to bitter. One phone call can report an illness or a sudden sudden passing of somebody we love. Life can go from sweet to bitter. I've learned that plenty of money in the bank can change into constantly overdrawn accounts. I hate to even log into the Chase app because I don't even want to see the balance. Life can go from sweet to to bitter. A good job can turn into no job, can turn into can't find a job. A good career can turn into a stalled career at a dead-end company while you watch the years go by. Life can go from sweet to bitter. But we need to understand that in this Christian life, in this walk with God, we are not promised always sunny days. We are not promised that the constantly we will have the sweet serenity of peace. Sometimes in this life, things turn from sweet to bitter. But I want to say to the sisters that are here today, take heart. Because although life can indeed go from sweet to bitter, you can be assured that God has neither abandoned you, neither has God forgotten about you. In the book of Ruth, Naomi knows a thing or two about life going from sweet to bitter. The story picks up with her, her husband, and two sons moving from Bethlehem to Moab because there is a famine in Bethlehem. Within a short span of time while they were living there, her husband died. The word says that her two sons went on to marry Moabite women. But but then within another short period of time, Both of her two sons also died. 
They died fairly quickly after marriage. We know it because by the time that these two boys died, they, neither of them had had children with their wives. Naomi's situation went from sweet to bitter. Press three times. Within 10 years, Naomi has had to call the rabbi to ask if he could officiate a homegoing service for a man in her household three times. Three times Naomi has found herself in a funeral procession. Three times Naomi has found herself receiving Hallmark cards and hugs. Three times Naomi has eaten repast food. Three times Naomi has gone home to a dinner table that was more and more empty. Three times. Naomi has grieved the loss of a patriarch, a breadwinner, a laborer, a protector in her family in the midst of a patriarchal system. Three times. Naomi is effectively a three-time loser. She has trauma piled on top of trauma. Naomi has grief that is piled on top of grief. For Naomi, life has gone from sweet to bitter. She learns that the famine is over in Bethlehem, and Naomi decides that she will pack up her belongings, and she will pack up her pain, and she will return back to her homeland. When Naomi arrived back to Bethlehem with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, Naomi, whose name means pleasant, told the women in her hometown, don't y'all call me Naomi no more. She says, call me, call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She says these words. She says, I went away full, talking about when she left Bethlehem, and the Lord has brought me back empty. I'm talking to some Naomi's in here today. I'm talking to some Naomi's on the stream this morning. I'm talking to some women who know what it is to live life full, but have also experienced the empty. Let me say to you this morning, sis, you are not alone. That there are some sisters that are in this community that we call City Point Community Church who have or are experiencing what it is to live life empty. Whether that is relational emptiness, whether that is marital emptiness, whether it is financial emptiness, emotional emptiness, opportunity emptiness, self-esteem emptiness, there are others in here who used to be full, but right now or in the past have experienced emptiness. Naomi said, I left here full but have come back empty, and life is now bitter. When we turn the page over to chapter 2, the page also begins to turn in Naomi's life. But, but I think that for the sake of this sermon, we need to sit for a moment in chapter 1 for a little while longer. Because real religion ought to reflect real life. And in real life, pages and narratives don't begin to turn that easily. In reality, for seasons, you sit in them. You feel them. You grieve them. You question them. And you question God. That's the way it is when life goes from sweet to bitter. Naomi is in that place, sister, that many of you get to. When life goes from sweet to bitter, where your theology starts going to work and you question God and begin to reason that there must be something that I've done, there must be something sinful about me, there must be something wrong with me that caused the Lord to allow this to happen in my life. She says in chapter 1, verse 21, why call me Naomi, which means pleasant, when, watch this, the Lord has testified against me. And the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. Let me say to you, when things go from bitter to sweet, there's a few things that I see in this text. When things go from bitter to sweet, we should know that God's judgment isn't against us. That God's judgment 
isn't against us. When I first started really reading the Bible in my early 20s, I, I read a lot of Old Testament. And out of that reading, I developed this theology regarding suffering that basically said that when good things happen, they are God's blessings. But when bad things happen, they are God's punishment. It is easy to arrive there because embedded in many of the Old Testament storylines is this deeply held belief by some of the writers of the New Testament text that this is the way it goes. We don't get far in Genesis before there is a curse for doing a bad thing, Adam and Eve. Then Noah's son Ham is cursed for doing a bad thing. But later on, David is said to have been cursed through the death of that child that he had by Bathsheba because of the evil deed that David had done and also in getting Uriah, her husband, killed. The Jews go through in the Old Testament this series of blessings and curses from God as they go back and forth between loving God and serving God and worshiping God and then abandoning God, leaving God and forgetting about God. This framing of narrative can cause all of us in modern day, me included, to believe that every time something bad happens in a person's life, the conclusion must be that there is something in their life that God is judging. But can I say to you that Job disrupts this theology? Because Job is about this one central theme. That suffering can happen to good people even though they've done absolutely nothing wrong. The book of Job opens up clarifying that Job was a good man, a blameless man who feared the Lord. It, it says that Job was upright in all of his ways. But just as soon as the story identifies Job's goodness, we come face to face with his life moving from sweet, to bitter without Job having done anything wrong. He lost his children to death. He lost all of his wealth. He lost his health, and he lost all of his social standing. But, but so steeped is this theology of earned suffering in ancient Jewish thought that Job's friends speculate that, Job, this is the reason that all of this stuff has happened to you. That they like, Job, we, we know you got some secret sin going on. You, you must be low-key in these streets, moving in silence, because real Gs move in silence. Job, there must be something that you are doing in these streets, but nobody but God knows about it. They reason that there is some reason and it must be attached to Job's sin that calamity has befallen him. And all that has happened to him, they believe, is God's judgment. But then the writer of Job goes on to clarify to us that Job's suffering has nothing to do with sin. That Job's life moving from sweet to bitter is not in any way judgment from God. And so here we are in chapter 1 of Ruth. Naomi says in verse 21, Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity against me? In the story, Naomi believes that her frequent trips to the cemetery, her frequent bouts with grief, her life turning from sweet to bitter, she believes that all of that is because of God's judgment against her. Can I talk to the Naomi's in the room for a moment? Sisters who have seen life swift shift from sweet to bitter, who've seen sunny days turn into unexplained dark days, who have been hit by some of the heavy blows of life, let me say to you this morning that your losses, your suffering, your challenges, your tears, all of those things have not come as a result of God's judgment against you. In short, what I'm saying to you is the bad in your life has not come as a result of something bad you've done in your life. The second thing that I see in this story is that when things go from sweet to bitter, we not only know that it is not God's judgment against us, but we also know that God has not abandoned us. One time when I was in the National Guard, we were out on this training exercise. It was 
it was either in Joliet or it was out by Joliet. And I remember me and a comrade, comrade had been told to stay um, at this particular spot that was in the middle of the forest on this base. And at this point, it was about 7 p.m. So we stayed there. That's, that's what you do in the military. When somebody higher up tells you to do something, you do it until they tell you to stop doing it. And so we stayed there. It was about 7 o'clock when it started, 7 p.m. Hour rolled by, nobody came back. Two hours rolled by, nobody came back. It's, it's dark now, and we're in the middle of this forest. Nobody came back. More hours start to roll by, and here we are. I'm black. I'm out in or near Joliet in the middle of a forest. Coyotes are howling. Wolves are howling. We have M16s. There are no live rounds in these M16s. And we are out in the pitch black of night, and nobody's coming to get us. We began to ask the question, did they abandon us? Maybe you've never been in the military before. Maybe you've also never been in the middle of a forest during the black of night before. But perhaps there is somebody here who knows what it feels like to wonder concerning God whether you've been abandoned. Because this ain't how it's supposed to be. This is not how the story is supposed to turn out. This, this is not how it was supposed to go, the turnaround, the rescue, the God giving me double for my trouble like the prosperity preacher said. That should have already happened by now. Sis, have you ever felt abandoned? Have you ever felt written off by God? Left all by yourself, like God has resigned from your life, like God is no longer hearing your prayers, like God has cut you off. This is the feeling that Naomi has. Let me say that just as they return to Bethlehem, God starts showing Naomi that in the midst of her feeling God forsaken, God was ever present. It is in chapter 2 that Ruth has her eyes on a certain brother by the name of Boaz. And in order to understand why this is significant, you, you've got to understand the patriarchy of the time. What Naomi and Ruth have is attached to what their husbands had. It, it seems that now that their husbands are dead, the land that belonged to their husbands has been sold off to somebody outside of the family. In the story, the writer does not bother to go into details to tell us how they lost the land, why they no longer have the land, whether it is debt, whether it is attached to the, to the famine, what particular issue has caused this. But we do know that they no longer have the land, and so that means that Ruth and Naomi have not only lost husbands, they've also lost livelihood, they've lost property, they've lost assets, they have lost security. Ruth and Naomi are poor. When we see Ruth gleaning in the field, she is doing, doing what poor people do. And so all the property that was lost, the only way that that could be regained is it had to be regained by what is called a kinsman redeemer. Kinsman redeemer is essentially a person who is a close relative who has the right to buy back the land, to restore it back, to be within the family. So when Ruth meets Boaz, it is effectively a restoration of hope and an indication that God has not forgotten about Naomi because Boaz is a near kinsman. He is a near kin to the deceased husband of Naomi, Elimelech. And since Boaz is a near kinsman, if he and Ruth indeed hit it off, if they like each other, if they feel in each other, if he swipes right, did I, get, did I get the direction right? Is it right or is it left? Which one is it? Don't nobody want to say nothing. <laughs> if Boaz swipes right, 
it will effectively restore to Naomi and to Ruth everything in terms of the assets and the social standing that they have lost. I know I got some tender folks in here. Y'all playing. So, so as the story takes this turn, it is effectively an indication that in the midst of feeling God forsaken, God has not forgotten about Naomi. May I say to you today that that is a word to somebody. That no matter how dark it gets, that no matter how dreary it gets, no matter how low it gets, God has a way of reminding us that he has not abandoned us. Has a way of saying to us that he is still with us, that he has not given us up. So the way the story goes, Ruth goes to glean in a field that is owned by Boaz. Boaz sees Ruth and Boaz asks one of his workers, who is that? So Boaz finds out who Ruth is and he finds out the story about Ruth. And, and so Boaz puts on his best Denzel walk walks across the field with his swagger, with his sway. He walks over and puts on his best game to talk to Ruth. Ruth does not play hard to get. Ruth plays the humble, oh, who, me, kind of role. And she talks to Boaz. And we know that next she goes home and she says to Naomi that she has met Boaz and, and Naomi being the older, wiser, seasoned woman. There, there's a whole sermon I could preach on that because there is some untapped game that younger women are not tapping into that seasoned women have that we see in the text that, Naomi, that Ruth taps into for Naomi. Naomi told her, sit down, let me tell you how to play this. Na Naomi says, to her, I, I want you to go to him and I want you to go lay at his feet. She says, also, what I want you to not worry about when Ruth comes back to her the second time and says, what happened? Naomi says, look here, if he's serious about you, he's going to settle this matter before the sun goes down. This is old woman, older woman wisdom, seasoned woman wisdom going to younger man. She effectively says to Ruth, he ain't going to play no games if he's serious about you. If he indeed wants you, he is going to make it happen, and he is going to try to wrap it up quickly. Beyonce had this wisdom, right? She put it in a song. She said, if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. Naomi effectively gives Ruth that same advice. And so here it is, Boaz, indeed, he goes and he finds a nearer kinsman redeemer, somebody that is a closer relative than he is to Elimelech, Naomi's deceased husband. He goes to him. He also gets some witnesses to sit down together. They sit down together. He says, do you plan to redeem this land? Because not only was it a redemption of land, it was also taking everything that came with it. This is bad. It is messed up. It is patriarchal. I hate to even preach it, but the woman comes, the, the wife of the deceased man also comes with the land. So he says to him, if you redeem the land, you got to marry the wife. And you've got to father children by her so that the line can continue. The man who is a nearer kinsman redeemer than Boaz says, nah, bro, I'm good. And so because of that, Boaz is able to redeem the land, restore it back to the family. This restores the prosperity of Naomi. Ruth marries Boaz. They have a child. This child's name is not an unfamiliar name because it is a name that you will find in genealogies throughout the Bible. This son's name is Obed, who Ruth, who Naomi ends up nursing, and Obed ends up having a son named Jesse, and then Jesse pops up a little while later because Jesse is the one that Samuel comes to when God says he's about to anoint a new king of Israel when he rejects Saul. Comes to Jesse and tells Jesse, have all your sons lined up. God says, it's one of your sons. Samuel goes to pour oil and as God to give him a sign of which son it is. It does not pour on any, it does not run on any of the men. And then 
Samuel says, do you have any other sons? Because I'm sure, like, my prophetic power is not off. God said that it was one of your sons, and Jesse is like, I do have another son who's out in the field with the sheep. He's young. The Bible says he's ruddy. It's really, he's, he's, he's young and small and cute. He's not king looking, but I'll bring him out here anyway. He brings his son out, a little boy by the name of David. And the oil does pour, and Samuel anoints David as the next king of Israel. And if you have heard last month's sermon series at all, you know the story of David. And so David is the son of Jesse, and Jesse is the son of Obed. And Obed is the son of Boaz, is the son of Ruth, is the grandson of Naomi, whose life went from sweet to bitter, but if you read the Bible a little bit more, you'll see more of this genealogy play out because it doesn't just stop with David because David's line traces down through the Old Testament and then when we pick up in the Gospels, they start running down these genealogies again and there's David that is in there and his father Jesse and Obed who's the son of Boaz and Ruth and the grandson of Naomi on down the line to somebody born in the ghetto in uh, Bethlehem in a cradle, and, 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 and they called his name Jesus, and he was the son of God. And so what we see in the text, thirdly and finally, is that when life goes from sweet to bitter, God's plan hasn't moved away from us. For Naomi, I'm sure that it seemed that she was living life on plan B when they left Bethlehem because of the famine to even go to Moab. Moab is a little hood-like. Moab is not a place that you want to go, but they end there. This is not the life she imagined when she and Elimelech got married. She's already feeling that she's on plan B. Plan C, her husband dies. Now, I imagine she feels that she's living on plan C. Then her son dies. I imagine then she feels that she is living on plan D. Then another son dies. I imagine then that she feels like she is living on plan E. When she returns back to Bethlehem, her sentiments are sincere. Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me Pleasant. Call me Mara because I am bitter, because God has dealt bitterly with me me. She feels that God's plan has moved away from her. But somewhere I read in the New Testament where Paul picks up later and clarifies for the Naomi's, for Naomi here and every Naomi in the room or on the stream today that somehow or another in God's gumbo, somehow all things work together for good. Somehow God puts a little bit of this and a little bit of that in the pot and this and that and ingredients that don't seem to go together. But somehow through the time of life, somehow through going through the seasoning of life, somehow or another, all of what God has thrown into the pot that feels like plan B, plan C, plan D works together to form the plan A of God's plan. And so I simply close today to say to the Naomi's in the room whose lives have gone from sweet to bitter, who are living life in a space where you are saying, this ain't how it was supposed to go. This, 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 this was not a part of my spreadsheet for life. This, this was not when I was playing MASH in middle school. Y'all remember that? <laughs> this, this was not a part of it. And I feel God forsaken and I feel God abandoned. I feel God forsaken. I feel God abandoned. God has not forgotten about you. 
God has not forgotten about you. God has not abandoned you. God has not given up on you. God has not left you. God is still with you. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We thank you for your word of encouragement today to push us to be reminded that life can indeed go from sweet to bitter. Life can indeed take some horrible wrong turns. Turns. Life can indeed play out in ways that we would have never imagined. It can leave us with heartache, with pain, with deep trauma and deep grief. But in the midst of that, thank you that we are not alone. Thank you that we are not abandoned. Thank you that we have not veered away from your plan. Thank you, Lord, that all things work together for good to them that love you and to them that are the call according to your purpose. We thank you for that. I pray for my sister. I also pray for my brother today that is struggling with the grief that